So welcome back to our Bhagavad Gita course. And today we'll be discussing on one practical application of the understanding that we are not the body, that we are the soul. So there are multiple aspects to this understanding. And an important understanding here is that how does it help us to deal with various life events? Say, for example, whenever we have, whenever we go through the fear or the trauma or the grief of seeing a loud one die. That was what Arjuna was also going to face. So our session will be based on 225. I'll share the PowerPoint here. So how can we heal after the death of loud ones? Do we express or suppress our emotions? So we are discussing 225 in the Bhagavad Gita. Avyakto yam chintyo yam avikaryo yam uchyate asma devam viditvainam na nushochitum arhasi. So na nushochitum arhasi. That, oh, Krishna, oh Arjuna, do not lament. In fact, this is a recurrent theme in the uh, in this 20th chapter. Um, in this particular chapter, this theme is, uh, sorry, second chapter, this theme is recurrent and this particular word also, Natvam Shochitu Marhasati, Nainam Shochitu Marhasi, Nanu Shochitu Marhasi, that these, say, these particular verses come repeatedly, this theme, that do not lament. So what is lamentation and what is grief? Is the Bhagavad Gita telling us that uh, we should suppress our natural emotions is because, say, we have spiritual knowledge. Is it that we are meant to become unfeeling? So we'll discuss this in today's session. Broadly speaking, we, if you look, the Bhagavad Gita often has to be understood in the context of the Mahabharata. And we see in the Mahabharata, when Arjuna lost his son, actually Arjuna lost two of his sons. Iravan was the son who lost earlier, but a much more well-known and much, more dear son. Iravan didn't live with Arjuna. He was the son of a Naga princess uh, and he lived with her as the heir and the king of, future king of that kingdom. That had been the arrangement uh, made at that time. But Abhimanyu mostly lived with Krishna and he was very, with Arjuna and he was very dear. On the 13th day when Abhimanyu was killed and Arjuna was devastated. He crumbled, he cried, he yelled at his brothers. Why couldn't they protect him? So now Krishna doesn't uh, throw these verses at him. Natvam Shochitu Maharasi. Why are you lamenting? So Krishna does encourage him. And I'll come back to how he pacifies and consoles and encourages him. But the first point is, knowledge does not, spiritual knowledge doesn't mean the separation of human emotions. So broadly speaking, whenever we have emotions, we often think of two broad options for dealing with those emotions. One is to express them and the other is to repress them. Now, neither of them is entirely positive. So the healthy way to do is to process our emotions. And what the Bhagavad Gita encourages us to do is process our emotions. So Arjuna is being told here, do not lament. And yet, in both in the Mahabharata and in the Bhagavatam, there is a description of how the Pandavas grieved after the war got over. They grieved for all the relatives whom they had lost. Similarly, in the, in the Ramayana also, after Dashrat Maharaj passes away, then there is a statewide period of mourning that is described, that, that is ordered. And so it's not that they are all told to just neglect that, suppress all your emotions. That is not the point. The point which is made is, that you focus on developing your own, uh, developing on your own capacity to process your emotions and respond maturely. So what does it mean by processing of emotions and how can the Bhagavad Gita's knowledge help us to process emotions? So let's look at this. 
so we will talk mainly about you know when some loud one passes away at that time how how do we heal and in and as a part of that i'll also talk briefly about how you know what is the wound that death causes what is the fear and the pain associated with that so broadly speaking philosophy the bhagavad gita is giving us some philosophy and the purpose of philosophy is primarily to do two things to help us make sense of life what happens in our life to help it why is this happening like this what is life all about what is the world all all about so philosophy is meant to help us make sense of life and it is meant to guide us to deal with life changes so when something unexpected disorienting happens a philosophy the philosophy is meant to stabilize anchor reorient us that's why normally we may not feel the need for philosophy in our lives we just go through our daily routines we go through our various roles and responsibilities but sometimes life throws a curved ball at us sometimes things start going devastatingly wrong and that's when we recognize the need for philosophy this is what happened to arjun also he is faced with a fratricidal war and you know what is what is the point of life if all those people who i love and venerate i have to kill them to get a kingdom is the kingdom really worth it so he wanted to make sense of things and then uh, what should i do that was the primary question prachami tvam dharma sammudh chitaha so guide us how to deal with life changes and when we also study the bhagavad gita or we study any philosophy for that matter we have attend classes it is primarily these two things so make sense of life and help us to deal with life changes so when say for one aspect is death is an inevitable reality of life now how do we make sense of death the bhagavad gita tells explains to us that actually we are souls and as we discussed in the previous session uh, death is simply the soul going from one body to another body it is like we leaving one house rented house to go into another house but it is not that simple because when we are when we are in a particular life we are invested we are emotionally very deeply invested in the people around us in the careers that we have built in so in the positions that we have and especially among all these usually the relationships we are deeply emotionally invested and how do we deal with that so we may understand okay uh, that the die, that dying is simply leaving an old cloth old set of clothes and wearing a new set of clothes but if we are very attached even leaving an old cloth can be painful but uh, as far as the leaving the body is concerned we are enormously emotionally invested in it so i'm using the word emotionally invested in a neutral or non judgmental way we could say that we are attached but i'll talk about that a little later but just emotionally invested in it right now that's that's the word we'll use for it so if we are emotionally invested in something and then we suddenly lose it naturally it is going to hurt us so how do we deal with that that's going to be the next part so broadly speaking when there is death how do we make sense of it there are three main uh, problems associated with death one is past with respect to the past other with respect to the present the third is with respect to the future with respect to the past there is the loss of everything that is dear to us all that we have worked for is going to be taken away and it's it's very difficult to accept that the pres with respect to the present we can see the body especially if it's whichever death is sudden death then it happens in a few moments if it is a gradual death still we can see the body uh, which we often identify with either we think of it as i am the body or at least this is my body and we see it disintegrating in sometimes in horrible ways so that is horrifying it's just like say if we had a car and so one day we just went to our garage and saw the car was completely wrecked that itself would shock us what then to speak of if um, our own body in which we are living if our house was devastated by a storm 
and it was in ruins that would shock us and what to speak and what to speak of we when we are inside the house and the house is wrecked it would scare us so to see our body getting destroyed so that's a present and then third is the future as i mentioned over here fear of the unknown oh what's going to happen in the future where am i going to do go so for people who have no understanding of uh, philosophy the one fear is will i cease to exist completely and it's 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 actually very scary and uh, disconcerting at the very least if not alarming to think of a future in which we have no role to play we have no say in things in fact we we don't even exist so that itself is alarming and if we have some understanding that that we continue to exist beyond death then there is the fear the alarm of what is going to happen to me after that where am i going to go and that is also painful so therefore it's important for each one of us to recognize that these three broadly are the trauma associated with death and let's look at how spiritual knowledge helps us to deal with it so this we'll be discussing later in detail when we practice bhakti yoga when we talk about bhakti yoga in detail but essentially the whole process of spiritual life is that while we are growing we try to increase our attachment not just to things of the things of this world but also to things that beyond the world to the being beyond the world that is god so it is krishna so then if we are devoted to krishna then and if he is our greatest love then of course we still are invested in things of this world while they will be taken away but we will be going toward krishna and that that so the process of bhakti yoga decreases that pain of the wrenching loss of everything dear to us and the second is that when we are going through uh, the destruction of the body it is to the extent we have realized our identity different from the body to that extent the body's destruction deterioration destruction will not traumatize us uh, so either death can be death can be a uh that can be a devastating thing or it can be an inconvenient thing so if we are going by a car and the car breaks down now the car breaking down is not the car say tire tire gets a flat the car tire getting a flat is not the same as we getting a fracture the car tire getting car getting is a flat is a inconvenience which we need to deal with maybe we fix the car or we just uh, hire a uber or ask somebody to give us a lift and then we deal with the car later Uh, so similarly it's you know it's inconvenience which has to be dealt with so similarly for even for spiritually realized souls the body is breaking down is trouble but it is like a inconvenience it is not a devastating misery because they don't identify with it and to the extent we grow spiritually presently our consciousness is largely locked in the body and to the extent we practice bhakti our consciousness becomes unlocked from the body and the more it is unlocked from the body then what happens to the body will not cause us that much pain it's just like suppose somebody is very attached to cricket and their consciousness is locked in cricket and then if say their favorite team loses a match it will be unbearable for them but if they are not that attached to cricket then okay then their consciousness is not locked over there if their favorite team loses okay i don't like it but it's not the end of the world for me so that's how the process of spirituality is meant to unlock our consciousness from our body and third is the fear of the future that i discuss that when we understand that we are souls and we are developing a relationship with the whole with krishna then we understand either we will go to krishna or we'll go closer to krishna we'll go to some other situation where we'll be able to continue our journey toward krishna and that understanding can help us deal with the fear so there is a to make sense of things is more rational you know when some things happen we need to be able to make some sense of the things that's at a rational level and to actually deal with it it's not just the rational level is not enough 
there is an emotional level and there is a practical level also so uh, at emotionally how do we deal with our emotions and practically what do we do so we discussed right now how do we deal with the see at a practical level death is going to happen and at a rational level we understand the soul is eternal but at an emotional level how do we deal with the event so this is with respect to say our own death and this knowledge you can we, we can if we understand it in a, in a emotionally mature way that then, then it can help us to deal with those who are near death also now having said that this is broadly how philosophy can help us to make sense of death and deal with death now let's look at what happens when a uh, loved one somebody dies as so actually one of the reasons uh, that inspired my spiritual search at almost 25 25 30 years ago was that when i was in my 10th standard in india studying i i came i was one of the toppers in my university and it was a moment of great success for me the highest officer of the district where i was staying nasik he came to my house to congratulate and felicitate me my papers came my photo came in the newspapers and other places so it is a moment of great celebration for me and the very day that the district collector had come to my house that very evening uh, my mother was diagnosed with terminal blood cancer and although she was a gutsy woman she fought but was very advanced and everything ended within about in less than a month or 27 28 28 days basically so it was from the from the height of success from the height of success fame celebrity it was a sudden fall and it was very difficult at that time to make sense of things and that's that's the time when i was always a reader of various kinds of books but that was the time when i started reading philosophical books and another time when i started actually trying to make sense of what is life all about so after some time it was actually it took almost 5 uh, years after that for me to come to the bhagavad gita although i knew the bhagavad gita somehow i never thought of reading the bhagavad gita to make sense of things i read many many other books east northers west northers but eventually i came to the bhagavad gita and then i felt that if i had known what the bhagavad gita is teaching at that age it would be so much so much uh, i could have processed that whole event in a much healthier way you know there was we, we go through various ways in which we deal with death there is denial there is anger there is uh, distress there is there is confusion so we go through so many emotions because we just can't process that somebody who is so dear to us so important for us suddenly is no longer a part of our lives so this can equip us if such a situation befalls in our life falls in, or if it happens to some of our loved ones so broadly speaking let's look at this now i'm sorry actually i forget to share the screen i'm opening the powerpoint but i'm forgetting to share the screen yeah so i think i so what is the trauma of death i discussed this so basically when the death of someone happens it's traumatizing now how do we heal with it so at one level we understand that we are not the body so that the soul is here the body is here the mind is here so okay so so when the soul body and mind are there so just as we understand we are not the body we also understand we are not the mind but just as i earlier discussed that if the body is damaged it inconveniences us and we have to deal with the damage properly like if our car is punctured we have to get it repaired so we could treat the say the trauma because of a sudden life change like the de demise of a loved one to be like a emotional wound and when the emotional wound happens we it's something similar to a physical wound and the physical wound is say if somebody gets a fracture then broadly speaking there are two phases to healing from the fracture the first is rest rest means maybe the hand is put in a, if the hand is fractured the hand is put in a cast and then after that after the hand is put in a cast then 
uh, it told don't move the hand much and maybe that is for depending on the magnitude of the fracture for two weeks three weeks six weeks whatever after that then the person is told remove the cast and start moving the hand start moving start moving now initially there might be if the fracture is related to hairline or a minor fracture somebody might feel why do i have to put my hand in a cast i can just go on but actually the fracture will worsen so at that time rest is needed but once the body the hand gets used to that rest then after that moving is painful you say, no i just want to stay like this no you have to start moving otherwise that limb can atrophy and then because of because of disuse because of lack of use it can deteriorate so both phases are required there's a time of resting and there's a time of reengaging and similarly with respect to grief when we deal with when we deal with the loss of a loved one there are these two phases over there one is first we will need to rest rest means withdraw now how does one withdraw how does one give oneself emotional rest after that trauma so that is that now different people deal with distresses in different ways some people may say just leave me alone okay i am getting a message here that my internet connection is poor so if my internet connection goes off please let me know and uh, please message me on whatsapp gaur kumar prabhu you can do that or anybody else can message gaur kumar prabhu and they can message me thank you mm -hmm. so now uh, some people may want to withdraw into seclusion i just want to be alone and if that is the way they deal with it and, and if that is the healthy way for them to deal with it then they need to be given that space of course sometimes some people don't want to be alone but they just leave me alone they may need some friends around them some loved ones who understand them so we may have to take a little break from our normal routine of life and do what it takes to give us a rest for some people just if they are more introvert just, just let me be myself and i will process the grief some people who are extrovert they may they may want to feel valued and validated by having their loved ones around them and uh, then by that they can cope with the grief so that's why I, so whatever is required for a person to rest that is required that they do that and then after that is reengage so reengage means okay now it is a time this time is the greatest healer and then we need to move on with our life we can't stop we can't stop living just because somebody else is no longer living with us they have departed from this world so now there is a difference between grieving and lamenting lamenting is where one stays in the stage in the first you could say one stays in the stage of expressing emotions without processing them at all so it's natural if some loved one has passed away there will be tears there may be there may be trauma but the emotional wound needs to heal if somebody keeps keeps uh, resenting what happened keeps uh, keeps um, living in the past why did this happen why did this happen why did this person leave me and that kind of the lamentation is where we could say the difference this is the past this is the present this is the future mm -hmm. so now something has happened to us in the past and we have to deal with it in the present it's like if i was wounded by a fracture i have to deal with it in the present but the way i deal with it in the present is rest reengage and then i move toward the future whereas lamentation is where this is the past this is the present this is the future basically what lamentation does it it creates a wall between us and the future so it locks us in the past oh this thing happened and because of this my life is over now what uh, i can't do anything i'm helpless i'm a victim the world is so cruel and all love is false and people just withdraw completely into a shell and never come out of it so lamentation is where uh, basically lamentation is where we lock ourselves into the past unable to process what has happened and living perpetually in misery and often making others miserable 
so that is the kind of lamentation that the bhagavad gita says don't do that natvam shochi tum arhasi krishna is not saying do not grieve so uh, there was there were proper grieving rituals were there national mourning period was there that is that time as i discussed earlier lamenting means just staying locked in the past unable to process what has happened and living in misery thereby so if we understand that okay this has happened this is I much rather this had not happened but now that it has happened i need to it's a wound and i have to heal from it so how do i heal from it so that will be the last that will the remaining part of this talk now so basically there are three aspects to this uh, when we grieve we could that grieve when when there is distress after somebody has left then what are the broadly three aspects there could be many some more but these broad, broad categories is that what has happened to them where are they actually that that's the concern when uh, when somebody loved has passed away say if somebody we know has gone to a, an unknown place i say has come some remote place say some for they are they are on a safari in africa and there's no news from them so this worry what has happened to them the second is that okay they are no longer there to love us anymore so if it's a parent if it's a spouse if it's a guide then a mentor when they are no longer there for us then we feel a vacuum because of that that's the second part they can't love us anymore and third is that i can't love them anymore you know we may have wanted to express our appreciation our gratitude our affection for them and uh, we we ran out of time for that so these are broadly three components of the grief uh, so wh- how can we deal with them so the first part is the philosophical knowledge itself that what has happened to them that they are they are uh, their eternal souls they are indestructible and wherever they are they are under the guidance of krishna now this may raise a question that is krishna's guidance there even for those souls who are not interested in him who are not devoted to him yes it is there for everyone krishna says he is suhrudam sarvabhutanam he is the in 529 he says he is the well wisher of all living beings he doesn't say that i am just the well wisher of the devotees yes of course there is a special bond with the devotees and we'll talk about that in a future session but krishna cares for everyone sarvasya chaham hridi sannivishto he is there in the hearts of everyone so whether that person had lived as a devotee or as a non non devotee or whatever they are still under the guidance of krishna so krishna has a plan for them and krishna will guide them forward and they they are souls they are indestructible so that understanding itself can give us some relief can give us some relief okay it doesn't uh, otherwise we are just we sometimes say as i said earlier if we don't know where someone is we can make ourselves mad with anxiety what's happening to them what's happening to them we are calling somebody whom we love we are texting them and they're not responding and we get worried now of course when somebody dies there is no chance of contacting them from our side but at least we know that there is that they are under care that they are under krishna's care then the second aspect is that as i said the second aspect is that they can't uh, that they can't love us anymore so here there is a more philosophical point to understand that that whatever love anyone offers to us it is krishna offering that love to us through them that krishna is the source of all love and that love can come through many different channels but it is krishna who is giving that love so one of the most intimate acts of love is a mother uh, breastfeeding her newborn baby she is actually she has uh, she has uh, hosted the baby in her own body for 9 months and now she is feeding that child with with the product of her own body it's it's a very intimate act of affection protection reciprocation and the love among the mother and the newborn infant is especially intimate uh, but at the same time if we consider the mother did not do anything special to produce milk in her breast when the baby was born 
the same god who sent a child into the world through the mother's womb also sent milk for that baby for that infant in the mother's breast so basically uh, the mother is expressing her love for the baby but along with that it is god who is expressing his love for the infant through the mother so basically we are here and we'll talk about uh, again the many concepts which we'll discussing later but is horizontal relationships and vertical relationships so we have vertical relationship with krishna and a horizontal with others so whatever love we get in our various horizontal relationships so this relationship this relationship it's all ultimately an expression of krishna's love to us through those people so that is the mood of a well known verse in the dharmic traditions tameva mata cha pita tameva tameva bandhusya sakha tameva tameva vidya dravinam tameva tameva sarvam mama deva deva that you are my mother you are my father you are my sibling you are my friend you are my wealth you are my knowledge you oh lord are my everything what this means is not literally that the mother and the father are god but whatever love shelter affection i'm getting through the people around me my mother my father my siblings my friends and even through things like knowledge and wealth they also give us some shelter they give some stability they become our anchors in life so whatever i am getting through all these it is krishna who is giving these to me through them and understanding this can help us uh, okay now this particular channel is no longer open so yes that person now we don't minimize or depersonalize the channel through which the love is coming we respect and reciprocate with them also but at the same time we recognize that this is not everything that ultimately it is krishna who is offering us love through that and it is important for us to continue on in that with that understanding okay this channel is closed let me develop my relationship with krishna because that is the fount that is what is going to be eternal and then apart from that we also have we may find that krishna may open some other channels also now life is complicated it's not that uh the when somebody somebody passes away from uh, passes away that is for somebody close to us that creates a hole in our hearts now that hole may never get it's not that the miss the emptiness because of their loss will completely go away so, but what will happen is that as life moves forward as our consciousness expands you know our consciousness will expand and that hole will not feel that big we may have to live with pain but we won't have to live in pain so that's how krishna consciousness can help us to deal with that aspect of the trauma that okay they're not here to love me anymore and then the other aspect is that okay i can't love them anymore now they're no longer here i would like to do so much for them but i i, I have not been able to what can i do so again the same point that we have horizontal relationships and vertical relationship so if we consider the vertical relationship we are connected with krishna and krishna is connected with them so if we do some devotional activity and dedicate the fruit of the devotional activity for them that is a way in which we can do something for them at a spiritual level now because they, we are not physically or physically there with them so we can't do anything practically at the body level we can't even speak say emotional words comfort them or uh, appreciate them but if we do something for uh, something uh, devotional and offer that to uh, to them uh, dedicated to them then that way we can still do something for them so basically by such understanding gradually we can bring closure so there is a physical closure and there has to be an emotional closure and without that closure healing can't happen just like if there is a injury there is there is a the cut that has to be stitched and once it is stitched then the healing starts happening so similarly for us we need closure 
and one reason why say for in the dharmic traditions the body is burnt is to give a very strong uh, visually graphic sense of closure in different and say in some traditions the body is buried uh, but in the dharmic traditions the body is burnt uh, sometimes it may seem very jarring to how can you somebody you love can just burn them up like that but if you understand that we are actually not the body we are the soul and further that the soul has gone somewhere else at least the soul can no longer live in the body so that uh, rich, that burning the body gives a sense of closure both for that soul as far as the as observing people the observing souls sometimes if the soul is very attached to the body the soul may not leave may be hoping maybe i can reenter this body again maybe i can continue over here but when the body is burned that gives a sense of okay finality and irrevocable closure this body is no longer any good and then the soul is freed uh, to go to the next body and similarly for us also if you understand that actually we are souls then that 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 the body and soul are different and now the body is burnt then that also can bring a sense of closure so the the ritual of cremation now many people are uh, are adopting it primarily for say eco friendly purposes or whatever but from a spiritual perspective or emotional perspective it helps us bring closure it helps us bring closure and similarly we need to get emotional closure so that we can move forward and there can be healing so these are key points which i said that you know they may have to live with pain but they don't have to, that we we whenever we somebody departs from us we may have to live with pain but we don't have to live in pain and the hole in our heart may not be filled but the heart can grow beyond the hole and that is how we can heal from the wounds that we may face during our life journey when some bloody loud one passes away so i'll summarize what i spoke oh sorry i did not share the screen so these are two points i mentioned healing from the departure loss of a loved one and offering some bhakti activities for them so i'll summarize what i spoke i spoke today on the topic of how do we heal from the death of a loved one and how can the bhagavad gita's philosophy help us to do that so essentially philosophy is meant to help us do two things make sense of what is happening in our life and then give us tools to deal with those changes and this happens uh, so how does it firstly we talk about say death why is death a, such a traumatizing change what, what is so painful about death i talked about three aspects past present and future but the past or oh, everything that i have lived for i'm going to lose it present the body itself is getting right in front of my eyes i'm witnessing it deteriorating and getting destroyed and future i don't know where i'm going so the gita wisdom helps us understand that yes i'm going to lose the deal with the past say yes i want to lose all this but if i have grown spiritually then my spiritual inclinations and the lord uh, with whom i'm connect who is my eternal companion he still with me so i'm not going to lose him so there is something which i do carry from this life to the next something valuable and then if we understand that i am not the body and if we realize it to some extent then the body's deterioration destruction are uh, are inconvenience like having a flat tire it's not like a trauma it's not a devastation and then with respect to the future we understand that we are going closer to krishna we'll be under krishna's guidance and that's how the fear can be dealt with and then i talked about dealing with the trauma of losing a loud one and how do we deal with that so that basically we can just saying that i am not the body is not enough if something is wrong with the body we have to deal with it so similarly we can't just say oh these are just ignorant emotions is you're not the body why are you attached to somebody with the body no there is a emotion this is physical wound needs to be dealt with there are emotional wounds that happen when we lose a loved one and that has to be dealt with maturely and there is a difference between grieving and lamenting grieving means that we go through the process which will lead to healing lamenting means we stay stuck in the past unable to move forward and keep ourselves miserable 
So grieving and healing involves broadly two stages, just like in a fracture, we first rest uh, and then we re-engage. So similarly, with respect to emotional wounds, we need to rest first. And that resting may be different for different people. Some people may just want to withdraw and be alone, or some people may want to withdraw and be with only their close loved ones. And whatever is required for each person, they can do, and they can be supported to do that. And the second is re-engage. So even if somebody, if somebody wants to say, no, no, I don't want to re-engage in life. We have to, that is required for healing. Otherwise, just so the body may atrophy if the limb is not used after fracture is healed. Similarly, we may emotionally atrophy into loneliness and misery. So, so then we have to go. So then how do we deal with it? These two phases, how do we go to go through? We understand the trauma of death is, or where, what has that happened to that person that we discussed? And actually, that person is still there under Krishna's guidance. Then, oh, they are not there to love me. Actually, Krishna is, it is Krishna who offered that love through them to me. And he will continue to offer uh, to me directly if I connect with him and also through other channels in future. And what about, I'm not able to love them anymore. Well, Krishna, uh, uh, they are still connected with Krishna. If I do something devotional and dedicate the fruits to Krishna, then still I can do something for them. So just as the act of cremation brings physical closure, we also need to get emotional closure. And losing a loved one is painful, but as we process it through Gita wisdom, and we may have to live with pain, but we don't have to live in pain. And the whole, the sense of emptiness in our heart will be there, but the emptiness won't be so, so yawning, so consuming. The hole in the heart will be there, but our heart will grow beyond that hole. And that's how we can all deal with life's disorienting change, especially the loss of a loved one. So thank you. Looking at some questions here now. Yeah. So my father went through a lot of pain uh, before, before departing and uh, he was there to help me always. This is a question and from Ichaka Agarwal. So I can, it is difficult as I not have anyone who can give me the same support. Yeah. So firstly, with respect to the pain, yes, it's very, very difficult for us to see when some, somebody whom we care for is going through pain. So now we have, sometimes we have to think of things from also not just the pain that we are going through, but also from their perspective. Now that that chapter is over, now if it is a painful chapter, but it is over now, if our father had been here, uh, what would they want us to do? Would they want us to, would he want us to, uh, keep grieving continuously you would want us to move on with our life so, so in a sense love can be exp love and concern are expressed in various ways but one important way is also through service it is to do that which will actually please or at least to not please other person or at least to not do the thing which will which will disappoint displease hurt the other person so if you think from it, that perspective that perspective uh, the best thing we could do for them now is to actually move on in our life and whatever they sacrifice they did for us to help us grow up and be who we are. So we move forward and in a sense the parents move on through their children. So if we can create a we can create a good life for ourselves and then be grateful to our pair father and we talk about him when we get the right place opportunity. We appreciate what he has done for us. Then that's the best thing we can do. We all need to be resilient. And I will talk about resilience in one future session elaborately. But essentially, resilience comes when we accept what is unchangeable without accepting that everything is unchangeable. So if we don't accept what is unchangeable, we stay in denial. But if we accept that everything is, everything is unchangeable, then we could sink into passivity. So if a ball is thrown on the ground, 
the ball just hits the ground but then it bounces back sometimes the force may be so great that the, you can't stop the ball can't resist going to the ground but the ball is not like a say a glass paper weight which crashes and just cracks apart so our spiritual knowledge is meant to make us resilient not like a glass paper weight but like a uh, like a rubber ball so sometimes life will knock us down and the death of a loved one the, and the pain which they went through before death that's knocking us down but we need to rise up we need to be resilient and we can do it in the mood of service to them and yes now if they are not there for us to help now that's what that's what actually makes life challenging that um, sometimes uh, you know, we have people who can support and guide us outside and sometimes we don't have them and to some extent emotional maturity uh means to recognize that no one is obliged to fulfill our needs that doesn't mean our needs can't be fulfilled or won't be fulfilled that no one is obliged to fulfill our needs so as we grow up this is just the part of the life cycles that the people who have supported us they are no longer there for us to be supported the three two three things we could do maybe some of the important things we have learned from them note them down and then read them uh another thing is we can try to practically connect with krishna he is our supreme father and we can find out which devotional activities help us connect with krishna feel his presence feel close to him and do those activities when we feel that sense of emptiness or loneliness and also try to keep ourselves engaged not in the sense of running away from that emptiness but not letting that emptiness take over our life so gradually the heart will heal so how how can we uh, what can we practically um, what can we practically do uh, to offer the fruits of our uh, to offer the dedicate the fruits to someone to somebody who has departed actually it essentially means that we pray to krishna we it's not that there is some formal ritual there can be but we don't have to go into those technicalities in our heart whatever devotion we might be doing some bhakti activities regularly but you do something extra we might decide to maybe uh, <clears throat> maybe chant some extra japa maybe decide that i will read a sacred book like the bhagavad gita in the next one month and offer the fruit of that reading to him or we might decide to sponsor some sacred activity maybe sponsor uh some feast for devotees sponsor some say, sacred occasion maybe something for a temple or whatever there are different basically the normal activities of devotional service which are activities are there we do something extra and in our hearts we uh we pray to krishna that this i am doing it for them and then we can offer our prayers for their well being to krishna along with uh, offering that particular activity so it's, it can be formalized as a ritual but there's no need to go into the technicality ultimately krishna is bhava grahi janardana so if others in our family uh, keep grieving then it becomes very difficult for us to move on yes it may be very difficult but then it becomes even more important because unless somebody sets the right example nobody will be able to move forward so we can see that maybe we might not be the we might not be we might be younger in the family we might not be the most uh, whatever we might be the, not be the leading position in our family or we may be whatever it is but this is the time when we have to lead by example not by necessarily denying other people's feelings but by setting an example of being mature and people pick up that example gradually and of course sometimes if some people are chronically in in that lamenting mood then we may have to create some kind of distance see there is it's one thing if somebody is drowning and we are also drowning the first thing that we can do is we need to make sure that we are not drowning so we get to the land or we catch a branch and then we extend our arm to others to help them come out 
but if others start pulling us down then then and if in trying to hold on to them we let go of the branch in trying to pull them out we fall into the water then you know we may have to let go of them for that time that means that we we can't be so emotionally we can't get too emotionally entangled if somebody is in a chronically grieving chronically lamenting phase so we have to create some distance politely but firmly not spend too much time with them and change the subject whatever but in general if we set a proper example and if we try to understand and help others then we can also help them to move in a, on their journey of healing and that's what ideally we can try to do okay what do you what is immutable the so immutable mu, muti, mu, mu, mutable is not muting mutable is mutation over there the soul is immutable in the sense that it is unchangeable okay so i said that the soul is uh, under krishna's direction but isn't it better what we desire at the time of death we get what we remember at the time of death is of course but wherever we go whichever species we might go whichever place we might go krishna goes with us ishwara sarva bhutanam riddeshe arjuna tishtati brahmayan sarva bhutani yantra rudhani mayaya so 1861 bhagavad gita says krishna says i am guiding the i am wanderings of all living beings of course he would like us our journey to not just be a wandering round and round in the, in the karmic cycle he would like our journey to be an odyssey to a journey to a glorious destination journey back to him and that's what it tells in the next verse 1862 it says become de devoted to me and surrender to me and then you will come to me tameva sharanam gacha sarva bhavena bharata tat prasadat param shantim thanam prapsisi shashvatam so even for those who are not surrendered krishna is with them and they may not go closer to krishna directly but they are still under the shelter of krishna and krishna will guide them from their place to another place from where they are to the next place now do we have in our philosophy something like angels hmm. so in christianity they say that when our loved ones die they they become angels and they look down upon us and take care for us so as compared to that we believe in rebirth well this is a big question but briefly i would say that the other world is very complicated and now we get an understanding of the 14 planetary systems but if you read garuda purana and other things there are many many there are many lots of details so uh, now what exactly happens after death where does someone go how long does someone stay in a transition phase all that is very difficult to know precisely in the ramayana we see that at the end of the war ram when he wins the devtas come to bless him and dashrath maharaj also comes over there and basically dashrath maharaj tells him that i'm proud of you and then ram asks dashrath dashrath maharaj that please forgive kai kai and kai kai dashrath maharaj got very angry uh, he was devastated and infuriated and he said that you know i reject you as my wife for what you are doing but ram requests dashrath to recant that rejection and dashrath agrees to that so basically it seems that dashrath maharaj goes to heaven and from there he is watching ram now of course you can say ram is the supreme lord uh, and uh, that's true but there is also the concept of pitra loka where the ancestors go so i would say that we don't have to completely reject what christianity teaches there could be a possibility because we don't know the complete details of the vedic universe there could be something within it that some people might play some roles like that for some time but overall the christian idea is uh, uh, christian it doesn't have a very clear understanding of what the soul is somehow they consider that the soul and the body are intricately linked to each other and in fact they said that can actually, although the soul is at one level different from the body 
but the soul can't exist without the body and that's why they have the idea that there will be final resurrection just like jesus rose in his body to heavens uh, so similarly we too will rise in our own body and that's why they say the body is to be buried not burnt now of course they also know that the body is going to be destroyed soon it doesn't stay in the coffin for long but they have the idea that the heaven is going to be like a perpetual family reunion where all our loved ones who whoever it may be when we die we will be united with them and we will be there with them and we will live happily together that idea is i would say grounded quite that is not grounded so much in philosophy it is sentimental and there are a lot of problems which come up with that idea practically speaking logically speaking also say you now we knew our grandparents say as 70 80 years old so are they going to be in heaven eternally 70 80 years old well would that be a heavenly prospect for them if they are going to be young youthful then how are we going to relate with them as our grandparents so there are a lot of uh, the i think this in christianity jesus focused more on moral 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 morality of living he didn't really talk much about god and heaven directly and what people talk about is not directly from christianity but it is drawn from various other traditions many of the christian theologians and christian saints they drew, because the bible is if you read the bible the bible has stories and some lessons from it and it describes the incidents of jesus life and then before that the old testament describes the like what happened in the jews life but there is not much detailed description of the other world or detailed description of god so the idea of angels is not directly grounded in the bible so i would say some aspect of it might be true but not everything in it so if krishna has already arranged for what is best for the departing soul then what is it meant to pray for the departing soul what should be the mood and content for the prayer well if we start thinking from that perspective then why 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 should we need to why do we need to pray at all to for anything for anyone even for ourselves when we are going through difficulties we can say krishna has arranged everything for us why do we need to pray the point of praying is primarily connecting in the bhakti tradition in the bhakti tradition the understanding of prayer is significantly different from the understanding of prayer within karma kand karma kand is basically material religiosity where uh, we do something for god so that god will do give something as to us at a material level so in some ways praying is basically like petition requesting oh god do this don't do this let let this not happen let that not happen but in the bhakti tradition if we consider the prayers there are so many prayers like say we have brahma samhita we have so many other prayers there is practically no request in the prayers the prayers are primarily glorification of the lord so in the bhakti tradition praying is primarily meant for connecting with god and sometimes if something is heavily burdening our heart and then we speak that in prayer to god so that that burden in the heart becomes somewhat unburdened and then we can further connect with god so sometimes uh, say if we are very burdened by something we talk about that with someone else in even that those people, that person doesn't offer us any solutions to the problem but just talking with them gives us some relief if we unburdened and the same applies with respect to that also so now uh, there is not a natural concern we may feel that we may intellectually understand that is yes, god does everything for everyone's good ultimately but still we have some emotions invested in that so we by praying that emotional lock that is there that can become unlocked and we can we can move forward in our life more gracefully we can move forward in a without healing so we primarily pray to connect with the lord and to also unburden ourselves of the emotions or experiences that are uh, that are burdening us and preventing us from moving forward in life and moving forward in our connection with the lord so <clears throat> we'll stop here and there are okay i'll take one last question and one thing if any further questions remain which we are not answered 
somehow on the zoom chat the questions get deleted when the uh, when the uh, class ends so you could send it on the whatsapp group and i will try to answer them separately afterwards and we will send you a link for the answers and even the previous sessions if you have sent some questions which were not answered i will answer them also so what should be our immediate response to someone whose loved one has passed away basically depending on our relationship we should be there in a mood of helping them assisting them now how we can assist them that will vary sometimes speaking philosophy and about the soul can help them sometimes just being there to do something for them showing that you know, even if uh, one important person has passed away there are others who are there to care that can help so if we have a service if we have a service attitude if we think what can i do for this person and we pray to krishna krishna please give me the guidance how can i help this person this time then we can even speak the philosophy and sometimes the philosophy can give a lot of solace to people but it should be done in a very very sensitive and kind way people shouldn't feel that we are using the death of their loved one as a forum for stuffing our philosophy down their throats if we try to start doing that that will be very alienating so we sensitively think that i want to help and how can i help and one way we can help is by in philosophical wisdom one other way we can help is by sometimes just uh, being there with them sometimes some just some healing some kirtan some healing music some spiritual music can have a calming healing effect so if we maintain a service attitude krishna will guide us with the intelligence of how best we can help so thank you very much hare krishna